it's a lot of ground to cover the history of the UNIA in Belize. So with that, I would like to begin. Marcus Garvey and the UNIA in Belize, 1918 to 1937. This is the man who helped to spawn the history that we are going to be discussing today. And he's 121 years old today, and we wish him a happy birthday. The very first intimation that the UNIA had reached Belize comes in a document, a letter from Marcus Garvey to a man called D.B. Lewis living in Corozal, British Honduras. I was asking the minister when we met on Friday night, tell me about Corozal. Why would Garvey have discovered a man living in Corozal? And look, the letter that Garvey wrote is November the 1st, 1918. Do you know that this is the first document describing a connection between Garvey in America with the Caribbean? Took place here in Corozal in British Honduras. Now, all of this gibberish is because the U.S. military censors took the letter out of the mail because it's still during World War, nearing the end of World War I. And here is what Garvey, according to the censors, report. The writer encloses 12 copies of an appeal to the racial instinct of the Negroes calculated to incite hatred for the white race by urging them to do like, quote, the Irish, the Jews, the East Indians, and all other oppressed peoples who are getting together to demand from their oppressors liberty, justice, equality. And we now call upon the 400 millions of Negro people of the world to do likewise, close quote. Also informs addressee that he sent to him 50 copies of the Negro World, that's Garvey's newspaper, which had only just begun to be published, and will send him 50 copies per week, and wants addressee to do everything to help the movement at addressee's end, so that they will have a very strong branch in British Honduras in a short time. I say again, this is the first indication of outreach on the part of Marcus Garvey to any group in the West Indies. Now, how did Marcus Garvey know about a man called Lewis in Corozal? I don't know. Do you? What kind of network did you have, did Garvey have, such that they were making these subterranean connections across the water? How did Lewis in Corozal know about Garvey, such that Garvey could send him all this stuff? I wish we knew, all we know is that on November the 1st, Garvey wrote this letter, and we have to thank the US military censor for preserving this, but the original letter we don't have. Do you think that if a group of us went to Corozal today, there might be people who could tell us about Mr. Lewis? See, there's work for us here in Belize. There is Corozal sitting way up there in the north. The UNIA is up there before it gets down here to Belize and Stan Creek. Now, 
this is a letter from the then acting governor of Belize, dated February 15, 1919. Sir, I have, he's writing to Rufus Isaacs, the English ambassador to the United States. I have the honor to invite your excellency's attention to the enclosed copy of a paper entitled The Negro World, which has been finding its way to the colony. The object of the paper appears to be to incite racial hatred, and I should not be surprised if the paper was supported by German or Bolshevik money. In other words, between November, when Garvey dispatched the 50 copies of the Negro World, November, December, January, and the middle of February, the colonialists discover that there is in the midst of this society a newspaper called the Negro World in circulation. Now he says on the 17th a follow-up letter written again to the English ambassador in Washington. Sir, in continuation of my confidential dispatch of the 13th of February regarding the Negro World newspaper, I have the honor to draw special attention to the issue of that paper dated October the 26th, 1918, which contained the following in large type. And this is what hit the colonialists in a way they had never anticipated. And here is what Marcus Garvey said. Arthur J. Balfour of England says the German colonies, meaning the German colonies in Africa, should not be returned to Germany. I agree. Let Balfour know that England shall not have them. They neither belong to England nor Germany. They are the property of the blacks. And by God, we are going to have them now or sometime later, even if all the world is to swim. What is that word? In blood. I can't get the world can't be free. Oh, half the world can't be free and half slave. Marcus Garvey. Can you imagine what <laughs> these colonial officials in Belize, British Honduras as it then was, reading this stuff and realizing that people here are disseminating this stuff? This is madness. The next governor, the, the next official is Governor Eyre Hudson, who would be the governor here from 1919 through 1925. Now this takes place in the immediate aftermath of the riot, the famous Belize riot. It's the greatest riot of the interwar years between World War I and World War II. The riots of 1937 and 38 in St. Vincent, Barbados, Trinidad, and Jamaica, and St. Lucia. Those were major riots. But until that time, the Belize riot of July 1919 is the largest in the entire Caribbean. It was so large that the governor and the chief justice had to seek refuge on a boat in the Belize harbor because they feared the blacks were taking over, the, likely to take over control of the city of Belize. Here is Governor Hudson, my lord, this is to the Milner, the colonial secretary, referring to my secret dis dispatch of 30th instant on the subject of the recent riots in Belize and subsequent events. I consider it advis advisable to address your lordship separately on certain subjects re referred to in that dispatch. 
I wish, and it will be for your lordship to decide whether or not it should be published. I offer no objection to that procedure and that it may be edited before publication as you may consider advisable. Among the subjects that Governor Hudson will bring up is the impact of the Negro world. The third grievance put forward was one felt by the town's people, viz, the suppression by Mr. Walter, acting governor in January last, of an American newspaper, The Negro World. I enclose a copy of the newspaper referred to, which was believed to be under German influence and a part of their propaganda. Mr. Walter reported to me his action soon after my arrival, and he showed me the correspondence with His Britannic Majesty's Ambassador to Washington, which I have now shared with you. In conclusion, I cannot too strongly impress upon your Lordship the necessity for giving the white population of Belize, and in fact, of the whole colony, protection by European troops or by the Navy for some time to come. If this is withheld, I must record respectfully that I cannot be responsible for the consequences. Now this man, Air Hudson, who was governor of British Honduras from 1918 to 1925, in his private correspondence to various colonial officials, revealed his deep-seated negrophobia and that he thought momentarily at least that he was about to meet his maker in a racial uprising. At one point, Hudson notes, quote, I thought all was up. A Negro sober is bad enough, but a Negro drunk is a devil. <laughs> they were running scared. <laughs> we had put the fear of hell in them. Now, this is this negrophobic governor who is a representative of the great British Empire who had drawn into the vortex of the conflagration that was World War I our sons from the West Indies. And this is a poster, a recruitment poster for members of the recently formed British West Indies Regiment. These are some of our sons who went to fight in the great conflagration of World War I. This is actually at the dockside here in Belize, people coming to say goodbye to the young men our boys who were going abroad to join the troops. This is Jamaica, the volunteers going off to fight for crown and empire. This is a wonderful photograph of a young man who had joined the regiment. 15,600 Men of the British West Indies Regiment served with the Allied forces. Jamaica contributed to thirds of these volunteers, while others came from Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, the Bahamas, British Honduras, Grenada, British Guyana, now Guyana, the Leeward Islands, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent. Nearly 5,000 more subsequently volunteered to join up. So roughly 20,000 West Indians from the entire English-speaking West Indies, or the British West Indies, as it was called, went to fight against German troops in World War I. Now, why have I brought this up? For two reasons, as you will see. 